She received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the American Association for Music Therapy, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, she's on the faculty of Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the, the Lehman College of uh, City University of New York. So we're just really happy to have you here. Thank you. Look forward to talk. Thank you, Laura, so much. And, and thank you, Isabel and Raina, too, for the wonderful talks this morning. So you heard this morning about um, how music can be used and how we can study music to look at developmental issues and look at what are those mechanisms that inform function or help develop function in children and, and adults who may have some kind of perceptual disabilities. My work is at the other end of the life lifespan working with people who had possibly normal function throughout their life, who at some point um, develop a neurologic disease, have a stroke, uh, develop Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's that leads to some kind of cognitive impairment. So what I'd like to do is show you some of this and also bring in um, some of the emerging neuroscience research that talks about that. When I first got involved in the field in music therapy, I was placed in a nursing home with people with end-stage dementia. And a lot of the work in music therapy tends to be psychotherapeutic or educational in nature. But when I was working with people in end-stage dementia, I was told that they had no brain function left. This is back in 1978. And yet, and yet, and those of you who have worked with people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia know that they recognize and respond to familiar music. So my question was, how does somebody perceive, how can somebody's brain process noise in the environment as a familiar song? How does that information get processed in somebody who has such impaired cognitive um, processing? And so it was really by good, good luck that when I came to Beth Abraham in 1980, there was a neurologist there who was asking about movement disorders in music. And so the two of us, started asking these questions back in the early 80s. Can, can the brain change? Those of you who've been around a long time know that the concept of neuroplasticity has only become accepted maybe 20 years now, right? But 35 years ago, if you told somebody the brain changed, they'd laugh at you. In fact, we, Oliver, Dr. Sachs, and I were laughed out of a 
neuroscience lab because we asked if they can help us study music. And they said no. Music is too complex. You can't possibly study it in a scientific way. But as the years went on, it was obvious that there were mechanisms at play. And one of the early things that I had seen was work by Larry Squire, who was doing um, at least theoretical work on memory function. And he presented the concept of explicit and implicit memory and how that works. And it became obvious that people who had dementia were functioning on preserved function that was still available to them, but not through the typical mechanisms of somebody who is incompetent or impaired. There was something about music that informed these very strong and robust subcortical networks that were still very functional and could still be called upon to bring function, functionality back. And it wasn't just a fragment in time. It wasn't just um, sort of a, a flip of the switch type of thing that would be um, you know, ephemeral and, and go away in a minute. But that over time, if that stimulation was provided, there would be some improvement or some kind of recovery. So we see in, in this chart, when we look at long-term when we look at long-term memory function, you can see that there's many aspects. There's um, the declarative memory, the short-term, the declarative memory that the person with normal cognitive function usually doesn't have impairment, right? So that's the ability to recognize names, to understand time and place. When we work with people with cognitive impairment, we talk about whether they're orient oriented to three things, to time, place, and person. So. For most normal people, that's not a problem, but for people with memory deficits, that is a problem. But what you see come through are the non-declarative or implicit functions. So things like habituated skills. And what's known now is that some of the regions that are involved in making those possible, which regions are in in included when that particular function takes place. So think about that when you see these examples. and. Imagine, if you would, um, possible research studies that you might be able to do to help us understand this phenomenon. So over the years, obviously, there's not only been an increase in scientific, rigorous scientific studies, Isabel and, and Robert Zittori and others, um, in looking at this work, but there's been popular media books uh, that have brought consumer attention, public attention to uh, the interest of music in the brain and possibly understanding how and why music is so much a part of us as human beings and why it plays such an important role in our lives. And we also know that music is has many parts. There's many elements. Those of you who study perception know that there's um, different gradations, especially in the, in the sound lab, in the live lab, how you actually can adjust the acoustics you know, and our perception is is based on all of those processes happening. Um, but then inform things like memory, mo um, emotional visualization, mode of control, and meaning. So when I'm looking um, at patients, I'm looking at what's what is the deficit at the bottom level, and is there some residual functioning at the high the levels below that above here in this diagram that is still intact that can be informed through music interactions. And over the years, obviously you know these, um, that so many areas have been indicated in music processing, music perception. In our clients, what we try to find out is which areas are damaged, and even despite that damage, are there other areas that are still functional that can inform them the complete structure. So if you're missing um, part of the, the frontal temple, though, how does that change your ability to understand sound? So we know that in people with frontal temporal dementia that they actually have diminished perception of sound. And then sometimes they actually change. All of them, Dr. Sachs has this interesting story of somebody who has frontal temporal dementia who actually changed their um, enjoyment of classical music and started to listen to heavy metal because the classical music just sounded too strange. So the brain changes when these types of lesions and impairments take place. So how can we look at the elements of music to then inform uh, rehabilitative goals? So one of the things that we know is that when somebody has a brain injury, they, 
whether it's from trauma or um, stroke or even a progressive disease like Alzheimer's, that usually the first deficit that's presented is problems in executive function. How do you do something? Um, Multi-step planning becomes a problem. Even focus and attention becomes a problem. We heard this morning in, in working with children the, the crucial um, importance of attention in order to understand and form a level of comprehension. So attention is damaged. And mental flexibility, being able to process complex stimuli and then being able to understand what's needed. Music can form those three elements, at least that's what we've seen. We know that novel sounds, sudden sounds, arouse attention. That's our fight or flight response so at a very basic level. Um, they hold attention if they're salient, right? But we also know that familiar sounds, songs that, not only songs, but sounds that have personal importance to an individual, will also grab attention, hold attention, and if the stimulus is kept or presented long enough, that attention also holds. And that's important for therapy because as you hold attention, you're able to improve frontal cortical function as well as other types of cognitive ability. So how many of you, I know it was popular up here in Canada to a live inside. Anybody see that film with Henry and the iPods and Alzheimer's disease, right? So what you saw there was an instantaneous, at least the Michael who did the film, um, really captured those moments of awareness, those in the moment um, ahas with the, with the patients as they recognized and were connected with music that was personally important. <coughs> of course, he had lots of video that he edited, so he wanted it to look feel like a bit. Most of the time, that kind of immediate response, that kind of emotional immediate response um, is that sudden. There's that without processing, without understanding that internal um, personal connection to that music is stimulated. So even if the person isn't able to recognize the song per se, that sense of personal connection is there. And that's what you see in that response and that recognition. So recognition is a level of procedural ability that is still preserved, even though the person doesn't have an understanding of why they know it. But Sometimes you need to present the stimulus in an extended period of time, almost as a way of priming the brain to respond. Um, we know, any, if any of you have uh, relatives with dementia, you know that sometimes you'll talk to them and it looks like they don't know what you're saying, they just don't pay attention to you, but if you sit there and repeat it several times, you get a response. And that repetition is needed to allow that response to happen. So I want to show you a clip, and you can tell I've been around for a long time because my clips are old. But, but in this clip, this woman I know recognizes this piece of music. She doesn't sing it when I play it the first time. I, in fact, I have to play it for 10 to 15 minutes repetitively until she shows a response. So listening and waiting for things to sort of get revved up. If you think of the brain, if you think of all the oscillating, if you think of like typical oscillating circuits and stuff, you sort of need to generate enough electricity for something to happen. And so for people who have mental slowness or processing slowness, having the stimulus repeat enough to allow the response to take place may take some time. And that's what you'll see here. So over the years, we've always knew that familiar music had a way of, of reaching people with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, a lot of anecdotal stories from family members and, and people who work clinically in the field talk about these miracle moments that they call them, when that connection is made and the person responds and there's a sense of knowing. Um, a few years back, Peter Janata did some studies with his students trying to understand what are the, where in the brain does this consolidation or recruitment um, happen when a piece of music has elements that make it familiar and what all those elements and what he found was that songs that have personal importance that represent time and place they um, 
represent people in your lives. So personalized elements that are attached to that piece of music give that music more salience to that individual. And that salience um, actually recruits, I guess, multiple elements because uh, the point at which all of those elements are processed or come together in is in the area that either refers to as the medial prefrontal cortex. So if you think about um, how cues inform information, and if you have multiple cues or cues that have multiple el elements of salience, you can see why personalized music is so uh, such an effective therapeutic tool because it has multiple elements of salience for that individual. It's not calling upon just one aspect of neurologic response, but actually drawing upon multiple areas that if one piece is missing, the sum of the other parts can make up the difference. And I think that's what we're seeing clinically from time to time again with our clients, where there may be sort of a gap in the circuitry, but there's enough network involvement in that function that you can close the loop and allow the function to happen. And, and in procedural type of memory, we know that it's those overly preserved mechanisms that can be called upon when damage happens from a neurologic disease. We've heard this in this, uh, in this morning in the studies with children and language development about the importance of rhythm and stress and intonation to inform and influence Brazilian speech. Those of you who are familiar with Congresswoman Gabby Giffords in the United States, she was the Congresswoman who um, had a severe gunshot wound and was nonverbal for, men for quite some time after the injury. And yet it was through music and singing that she started to get her words back. And what we've looked at over the years is the use of familiar songs and singing familiar songs, familiar lyrics, as a way of priming the word retrieval mechanism. So if a person can independently um, initiate a word, is there a way that familiar lyrics that are overly learned can encourage or stimulate the um, release of targeted words at the right time? And the example I always, I, I guess everybody knows this, if I sing a song and leave out a word, I want you just to fill it in. Okay, so you are my sunshine. Okay. Wasn't really hard, right? <laughs> so, so targeted words that are overly um, preserved, you, know, I, you almost can't put another word in that place, allows for this kind of retrieval um, mechanism just for single words to be stimulated and to be um, practiced. For those individuals who can call upon those words on their own. What's happened in our, in our clinical studies is that if that is used as a tool, that after the person sings those words, those fill in the blank words successfully, if you were to do a naming task, so the speech therapist blindly does a naming task after the person sings with me, um, you'll actually see the person naming naming the targeted objects quicker. So the question is, does singing familiar lyrics serve as a sort of priming tool for word retrieval? And so we've been doing some work along those lines and have seen quite a bit of success in that. So let me show you um, another way of using, using rhythm and speech to help with speech recovery. So these are people who've had normal speech, at least the first woman. She, this woman was in a, had a stroke, um, was in a coma, was nonverbal when she came out of the coma. Uh, she had very bad dysarthria, which is a motor speech problem. So for her, the coordination of articulation and breathing and forming the sounds was mixed up. Her brain couldn't put together the or the sequence of how to speak correctly. However, what we learned, and this was a while back, um, that if the person would, and this is before Goffey's studies on, on melodic intonation therapy, um, 
that if the person would, was taught to tap along to the syllables of the targeted phrases and sang the melodic, sang the phrases in a very melodic way, so those of you who are looking at prose of the end, and know the timing, that's exactly what this exercise does, that the person was able to articulate and improve um, their intelligible speech. People in this particular study uh, were evaluated by a speech language pathologist and only had two to three syllables of intelligible speech at the point the study started. And then the, this particular intervention went on for twice a week, 45 minutes each, um, lasted for two months. And at the end of two months, they were speaking with 19 syllables of intelligible speech. So just look at the neck of, of this to get an idea of what it looks like. So in both of the cases, these are women who can produce the words independently with great articulation and great read support. But however, when they sing the words and, and are self-cueing, they're able to maintain the, the motor structure that they need to allow the articulation to be presented. In fact, this woman um, was born with cerebral palsy and never had very good intelligible speech. And I tell this story all the time because it was so unique. After two months, she was speaking so well that the people at her school wanted to know what new medication she was on. And all she could do was say, well, I, I'm, I sing, and that's what I'm doing every day. There's something about singing that brings together um, good breath support. It's very hard to sing without good breath support. And the motor mechanism is, I guess, I keep saying I guess because it's just so interesting to me, um, that how it recruits the proper motor sequence. Even though a person struggles to do it independently, and I think um, one of the things that you who are researching this uh, really in detail is how that recruitment of motor timing enabled speech seems to be one of the most crucial elements in rehabilitation. In fact, I'll show you an example with some of our patients with aphasia, um, that if the, motor, if the motor timing element, if their ability to self-cue is damaged, they don't really recover speech, even if they undergo um, rigorous speech therapy and music therapy, that the, the connection of motor timing to functional speech seems to be really crucial. And so that's almost an assessment tool for us clinically that we test first to see if they can self-cue. Um, even if they can't speak the words or make the sounds, can they, can they process cognitively the timing of the phrases they need to say? And so we, we know that if that's not damaged, we can use this kind of musical melodic um, intervention to help them recover speech. Differently, but similar to, differently from aphasia or, or um, yeah, from aphasia. This is another one. This is from one of the original Awakenings documentaries. So before the movie Awakenings came out, there was a BBC film of the actual patients. And this woman also has dysarthria very, and, and, and um, a bradyphrenia as well as uh, slowness of speech where she can't fully articulate the word she wants to say. She doesn't have enough breath support. She doesn't have the motor support. But yet, she, when she sings, her posture changes, and the words come out very clearly. So again, there's something about the recruitment of breath and motor function that allows the speech to be intelligible. So even there, you can see how immediate the singing allows for intelligible speech. And then once she is removed, once she doesn't have that kind of self-generated musical um, cueing, the self-initiated musical cueing, her speech goes, and she can articulate that well again. So there's something, again, about that recruitment of breath support and motor function that the music allows to happen and holds for that moment when she's singing. Sometimes this is another case where this is an individual who had spent his whole life with music. So in his, he had um, a bilateral stroke, had lost his speech. In fact, 
He even lost the rhythm of his speech a little bit. He lost some of the melody or the, the melodic contour of his speech. And because he was so immersed in music his whole life since an infant, he and his father had recorded uh, all the American folk songs way back when. And by using his recorded music, songs that he had studied and he had recorded as a, a priming tool to allow him to try to regain some of that, his word and speech, um, he started to recover. In fact, in the two, three months he was in our subacute rehab, he was able to recover um, very good communication skills. He was just a little bit slow and very deliberate in the words that he used, but he was able to speak. So I want to show you um, an example. I'm just going to escape from this for a second. This is him at the beginning. None of the words make sense. He's going ba ba la la, and the rhythm's off. He's sounding almost like the children who mix up their words and say the words at the wrong place. He had that type of speech language, just making them jogging sounds. So that's me. He couldn't do that very simple folk song. In a couple of weeks, this is what he sounded like. It's not on me. Now the compass closes. Can the world cut off? He's still stumbling. But at least he has the words. He has the melodic phrase. He's stumbling on the words. Another one later. On the 14th of October, on the 14th of October, on the 14th day of October, I guess my team and party will do right and get up, us a little guy So, 
here's a man who couldn't participate in traditional speech therapy. He couldn't name tasks. He had trouble um, following and processing some of the cues, but using his overlearned repertoire of lyrics and using the singing of those lyrics over time as a way of him regaining some of his speech, not only was he able to sing the songs clearly, but that technique and that exercise actually allowed him to regain communication. That's the only thing I don't have is his speech, but if you heard him, this is, um, I can say his name, that's why I can block it out. If you're familiar with Alan Lomax and the American Folk um, Song Anthology, um, he, by all intents, all, all evaluations that were done by the neurologist and by the other clinicians, his stroke was so broad that he shouldn't have been able to regain his language. And so what happened was, and this is the idea of full immersion and repetition, is people like Pete Seeger and other people used to come in every day to sing with him. So I would sing with him during the session and evaluate how he was doing, but even his social workers sang to him. And so this kind of constant practice and using these songs that were so well embedded um, that he had access to but just had trouble you know, retrieving them automatically became the tool for him to regain the speech to the point that he was able to speak. So in this case, using familiar lyrics to prime word retrieval has been a very successful tool. Then there's a, um, a process by which the musical cueing is taken away. So as the person becomes proficient in singing the correct lyrics and the correct prosody and rhythm, then singing, not singing, um, it goes to the point of first singing all the lyrics correctly, getting that to 100%, and then taking the music away so the person is only reciting the lyrics. So now they're speaking the lyrics without any musical cue, but a rhythmic cue. And then at that point, presenting um, targeted phrases for them to repeat. And so the people with certain types of aphasia being able to use this tool using pre-learned um, lyric singing, familiar songs, as a way of um, stimulating retrieval of words uh, and having that carry over then to spoken uh, words and non-musical communication has been something that we've been studying for a long time and with good success. And the actual, this was published in the journal Music and Medicine, but there's one with the actual procedure of using it in another journal article. This is a woman um, with aphasia as well. In this case, we're doing targeted phrases to a familiar melody. Now, sometimes this works if the person has enough cognitive skill to be able to use that familiar melody to self-cue. But we do know that with some people with aphasia, um, putting novel words in a familiar melody is actually very confusing. So again, this is based on assessment of the individual if they're able to use the familiar melody then to help them self-cue, and I'll show you a really good example of that right after this. But interesting with this client is the intensity at which he watches the face of the therapist. And for those of you who are speech language therapists, you know this is crucial, um, is providing all the visual cues to the individual, the patient, um, so they can process what it is that they need to do. You know, I think as clinicians we do this habitually, but we know from research the importance of these subconscious mechanisms that inform responses, uh, whether it's from mirror neuron systems or whatever. Um, the idea that we pick up information about each other through nonverbal, um, visual, and tactile, and other types of processing, and those systems also inform functionality, even even though. Uh, especially when the person isn't conscious or isn't cognitive of what's going on. Subconsciously, so their brain is still processing this information at a very basic level. So you'll see how she's very keen on his face. She actually changes her facial, facial expression to match his, and that in, uh, in tune is, in tune, is informing his, uh, her responses. So the technique. Um, 
you can see how engaged he is with the, with the client. Uh, with, in fact, we have one video when the therapist goes to scratch his forehead, she actually automatically goes and scratches her forehead. So that kind of like interpersonal connection um, happens. I, I think sometimes you miss the importance of that. But I know there's some wonderful research going on right now about the importance of this kind of body language and interpersonal rhythm that actually informs function as well. So the therapist moving in a certain um, tempo is actually informing the speech and the movement views of the individual too. But probably really astounding, this is, this, um, Harvey recently passed away. We were hoping that Godfrey would have a chance to image him. Um, Harvey wasn't a patient of mine, but he was a man who um, had a major stroke, was nonverbal for several years. Um, in his speech therapy sessions, two or three years after his um, stroke, why this didn't happen before, I think he was so nonverbal that the therapist didn't even think to ask him to sing happy birthday. But when he did, he was not only able to sing the words, but he had the mental capacity to realize um, that if he could put familiar, if he could put words to familiar melodies, he would have a way of getting his speech back. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this clip. You'll see exactly that kind of melodic intonation technique, purely rhythmic, purely two-tone sing-song. But he himself was able to understand, um, I think Raina was talking about then, is it on YouTube, about the need for comprehension, that if the person who is learning the task doesn't understand um, why they're doing it, the carryover never happens. So in his case, he truly understood that he needed to change the way he thought about speaking and only thought about singing the words. And by doing that, he was able to self-initiate this technique. And in his case, there was perfect carryover, where in a lot of people with aphasia who do melodic intonation therapy, they do singing, may improve in a, in a short period of time and in the context of the therapy session. But the carryover only happens if they understand that this is how they need to think about speaking again. So unless they use the sing song technique, the carryover doesn't happen because the actual um, structural language of the brain has been damaged. But watch this. I'm going to again escape because the link didn't work. Tones. I mean, the, the real, you know, perfect example of melodic intonation. Um, two tones and very, very rhythmic. And at the end of the video, he explains to the audience that you see, I wasn't speaking to you tonight. I was singing to you. So what he did, actually, with his speech is, is him taking all the melody out of his voice because in his mind he's singing every phrase, but he's editing it mentally so it sounds more like speech. But because he can't speak in very, you know, envelope sounds, he's using, he's relying on that two-tone melodic um, prosody to allow him to be intelligible. And he was able to speak forever. I mean, he became, he formed the international aphasia movement and spoke all over the world, giving lectures about the points. The American, um, the National Aphasia Association thought he was an anomaly. And because of that, they wouldn't let him be a spokesperson of the field. And so he was so um, passionate about getting other people with aphasia involved in these types of singing programs that he helped create several clinical uh, group support programs in New York City and around the world where people sing. And then some of the aphasia choirs have developed out of that and people 
do find that they're able to increase in the bird retrieval as well as, as some of their functional speech by just participating in these types of programs. Clicking, I'm clicking this as if it's a PowerPoint slide, sorry. <laughs> So similarly, um, so we're looking, we looked at using overlearned skills to help encourage memory retrieval and improved recognition memory in people with Alzheimer's disease, using overlearned use of words embedded in song to help with retrieval and, and improvement in communication skills. And probably the area that's been studied the most is the use of rhythm to facilitate improvement in gait and timing. That's what Michael Tell, who's now here in, in Toronto, um, has, been, has been studying for many, many years and his wonderful research on auditory timing mechanisms and both cueing with, with sometimes called rhythmic auditory stimulation, RAS, to cue specific function. And you can see this so clearly. Um, Jessica Gron and others have, have looked at where the um, origins of beat perception happen. And this kind of beat perception is so well wired um, in our motor system as well as our auditory system and connecting that, that the pulse of sound can inform exact movement. Uh, it stimulates it or jump starts the initiation of movement. We'll see in, in people with Parkinson's. Bill also helps um, frame out the um, the type of movement as well, so uh, stride length, uh, aspects of, of gait. We know that this happens, um, if you go back to that procedural um, memory chart, that some function happens at the cerebellum level in perception, um, and motor timing, some of this stimulation and organization gets triggered at the basal ganglia level, so different areas and depending on the person's disability or where they're able to show functionality, we're able to fine tune how that musical cue is presented to maximize the response. So in Jessica's work, Jessica Grant's work, she's indicating these very primary motor areas um, as being responsive to uh, the processing of movement as well as um, timing mechanisms that can be informed through this type of, type of rhythmic timing auditory timing. Um, more recently, there was a paper published. It's, uh, this was at the Frontiers, the recent Frontiers. It just came out. Um, journal on music perception and cognition or something. Um, they studies looking at what happens when people are listening to live or real music, and what areas are stimulated when people are imagining the music or self-generating that. So in real music listening, um, areas of the cerebellar areas are activated, whereas in imagined music listening, there's pre-supplementary and basal ganglia in other areas that are stimulated. And it's interesting because in our, our patients, um, where we want them to self-cue, we want them to be able to internalize this rhythmic beat. And some of them who do have motor deficits actually change their perception of where the beat is and they'll feel it so we have to manipulate the sound so it, it really um, stimulates them in the right way to get them engaged. Also studies looking at even the imaging of movement words uh, excite areas of the brain that are um, also responsible for that movement. So even thinking about your leg, the word leg, will light up areas in the motor strip as if you were moving. So even if you didn't move a bit, um, these areas get stimulated. So how, do, um, how does rhythm, how does music inform other areas of the brain to act when um, that person can't get them initiated on their own? In, in the traditional uh, RAS, rhythmic auditory stimulation, we know that the rhythm in and of itself can cue gait very well. However, if that rhythm is part of a song that's very familiar, the thinking of that song can also then facilitate that movement. And so to have the kind of clinical carryover 
allowing the person to self-cue by singing or imagining the song actually provides the exact rhythmic timing that they need. And so we see with certain patients, for the, uh, this could be very successful. And we know that the timing of the music really doesn't change. I don't think there's variation. If, you, if there's a popular song that you know very well, it's very hard to sing it faster or slower. We pretty much have this, you know, perfectly remembered nuance of the, even close to the pitch of the song, right? So that's also part of this very deeply stored memory or memory tool that can en enable a person then to um, have a therapeutic impact on their recovery. And classic example of a person, this is um, where the rhythm is not only stimulating the initiation of movement, but actually carrying the movement for as long as the music is present. Oliver used to use a, a phrase from, I think, T.S. Eliot, that you are the music while the music lasts. And in this case, the music is the prosthetic for the person with Parkinson's, because while the music is playing, the internal mechanisms, and Jessica has studied, Jessica Grant has studied this quite a bit, with basal ganglia and auditory stimulation, and basal ganglia we know is very much involved in, in Parkinson's, that it, there's some indication now that even with the stimulation can improve dopamine production in the basal ganglia. So shooting these rhythmic pulses through the auditory system to actually um, excite these very motor mechanisms is why people with Parkinson's can initiate movement. But watch this because you can see that she has bradykinesia, she's very slow, she sort of shifted to one side, she needs an aid to help her walk across the room, and as soon as the music starts, she's on her own. So here, the rhythm specifically, and then the well, music too, but you can see how well it carries her. It allows her to follow through. If the music were to stop, and I've done this in, in clinic, if the music stops, the person freezes because the sensory chain, um, the, the stimulus change is so dramatic that it literally like shuts off the motor system. And so in this case, um, you know, clinically in music therapy, we like to see carryover, and we like to see improvement. In people with Parkinson's, what carries over is the flexibility of their movement or their ability to move. People who are doing dancing now um, in Parkinson's say that they're able to um, to walk better on a regular basis, uh, that they have better muscle integrity, they don't have as, as many spasms. Things like that, that's the carryover, but the music is still needed, the rhythm is still needed on a daily basis to help them have this kind of continuous flexibility. And the group, um, when people with Parkinson's can self-initiate, self-cue, they're able to think about the music and, and walk just as well. So the idea of familiar music with a strong beat as a way of, of enabling that um, carryover is important. So this idea of coupling gain to this rhythmic auditory cue time and time again the research shows that it engages both also not only motor timing mechanisms but perceptual mechanisms as well. So one of the other areas and this is something we're just starting to research is the idea of active music making and improvisation in real time. So most of neurologic music therapy is focused on very directive um, interventions that are very prescriptive in their nature, you know, the cueing, um, two-tone melodic intervention type intervention. But sometimes we see a patient in, in the clinic when they're engaged in active music making, um, they're able to do more functionally than they can without the music. And so one of the areas that's becoming really interesting is this whole idea of what happens in the improvising brain when there isn't that kind of self-monitoring that's going on, when the areas of the frontal cortex aren't thinking about what they need to do, or what the person needs to do, but it's actually free in the, in the act of making something or doing something, that this whole subcortical area comes into play and the person is able to do more functionally than they were. Any of you who are, are professional musicians know um, that if you think too hard about what you're doing in the moment, you usually make a mistake. 
right? So the idea of freeing the patient through this active interactive music making as a way of getting them from self-monitoring how bad they are, or how limited they are, to see if there's residual function that can be cued into, into being. So let me just show you, this is a lot of from Charles Lim's work, but let me just show you an example of what this looks like. So you can see how the woman, um, the more she got engaged, the more broader her range was, and, and um, she wasn't doing her therapy exercise per se, she was actually choreographing the movement. And so that sense of art um, as part of therapy or self-expression as a core part of treatment is also important. So if this kind of play, musical play, could be part of the therapy experience where the patient is not only engaged in the moment but fully engaged the one that they're not self-monitoring, they're not inhibiting um, the possibility of their recovery, we see so much more potential for carryover in that treatment. It's so funny because back in, this is way back when, when Oliver and I were um, going to the sciences, it was like this question, can, can we ever possibly study uh, what it is about music that helps animate the person, and we know through this wonderful, these wonderful collaborations um, that we are now able to understand why things that we've been looking at for the past 40 years um, are possible through music, and really starting to understand um, with the great neuroscientists uh, what are the mechanisms that allow that to happen. And by understanding those mechanisms, can we put them into very prescriptive light some of the um, basic neurologic music therapy techniques are the basic um, tool sets that we can use that are based on rhythm and tone and vibration and harmony that can recruit and connect or reconnect structures that have been damaged because of stroke, traumatic brain injury, or Alzheimer's disease. What are the common elements that are shared? How do, those, how do these shared elements then come back um, to allow for functionality. And so that is the hope of all these collaborations, is to provide better clinical work, better clinical interventions that can maximize and um, the potential for recovery after, at the end of um, a traumatic brain injury or some kind of chronic condition. So as we looked at children and acquisition of function, we could think about all the functionality we have over a lifetime, how that is connected with music and sound, and by understanding that mechanism, how can we then bring it back to the client, to the patient, to allow that preserved ability to come back and allow for recovery. So thank you very much. When you see recovery of some of the, the motor function, the speech function, what about the cognitive function? Okay. So, <laughs> attention to task is crucial. Mm -hmm. Where we saw it, actually, this is really interesting because one of the first funded studies that we had, this was back in 1994, with the Department of Health, was to look at music and memory. We were engaging people who had meant to. Well, they were institutionalized because of dementia. We, at that point, didn't know whether it was Alzheimer's or regular dementia. However, um, all of them were tested by a mini mental status exam. And the only, and we had a control group where they were doing regular activities that they were doing. And every program was being oriented. So the focus was on improving attention and cognitive skills and engagement and word type um, on, on task word responses. However, the people who were in the music groups, the ones who sang about those 
things, actually improve their mini mental status scores. And not only improve their mini mental status scores by a, a good percent that was significant, but they actually remembered all the words of the lyrics after the 10 months they were in the program. So, you know, song, I remember one of the opening songs was the, the words to welcome Phil Coleman Bienvenue from, from Cabaret. Well, they didn't know the words to the song in the beginning. And at the end of 10 months, they were all singing it. So the fact that even somebody with Alzheimer's disease can improve memory and retention, again, it depends on engagement time, on repetition, on, on meaningful engagement, those types of things. Um, for people who've had a traumatic brain injury, depending on how severe that injury tends to be different from Alzheimer's, because Alzheimer's is a degree of cognitive impairment, whereas um, a frontal lobe damage can be, if it's so severe, the chances of, of uh, short-term memory recovery would be a problem. So it depends on the case, but in people with, with Alzheimer's disease, we have seen a kind of improvement in memory and, and being able to learn things. Right. And then, and that's within the tasks and the that's right. training. And, and has there also been evidence in terms of recognizing others or in terms of social behavior? So, yeah, there's just an anecdote. I mean, this is a story where he was plotted of one of the people in our study. Um, he hadn't remembered his wife's name. And in fact, she would walk into the room every day. He didn't know who she was. He thought, you know. And then one day she walked. This was, we, the study was 10 months. This was midway into the study. She walked into the room and he says, Mary, where have you been? <laughs> and so, so the challenges though, this is like, you know, beware. Um, there, there's an ethical issue about improving memory with somebody who's lost awareness of, of what's happened to them. So it gets to the point with somebody in the end stages of Alzheimer's disease, they, um, do you really want them to be aware. We had another patient, different from this, the one who recognized his wife, who now realized she wasn't home, because now her attention of her surroundings improved, and she was miserable, you know? And so how do you, so there's an ethical issue too, of how much do you do, what's good, what's beneficial to the individual, and when do you stop it? Oh yeah. So that's that's called this a uh, sound beam. It's it's made in the UK, but it, um, there is a company in the US that sells it. Um, it was originally used for uh, for dancers to be able to interact with sounds as they were moving on stage. And then about 20 years or so uh, ago or so, it started to be used in special ed for kids with cerebral palsy, so they'd have a way of of interacting with sounds and making music and being creative. There's some digital-based programs now that are probably cheaper and more accessible. Um, there's a company in Boston that's working on um, a video software program where you can actually um, quadrant off the screen, so you use the, the laptop camera, quadrant off the screen, um, it captures your head and upper body, arms, and then you can allocate sounds throughout the screen for the person to interact with. And so we, we've been using that for rehab as well. That seems to be a lot more accessible. We can even bring it into the home for therapy. Yeah, Hi. Um, I just have a question about uh, whether there's been research that uses like something like RAP, for example, for more um, like rhythmic for coordination speech. and uh, facilitation. Not, not maybe not necessarily only for speech, but also, for example, to improve walking or yeah. gait or uh, even like to begin like coordination of things or things. Yeah. No. Um, actually, that's that's a good question because some of our younger patients don't have the same type of speech problems. I mean, I'm. Is this an area that you guys can study? Because you know how you, uh, people have been studying um, the languages like like um, like Chinese and you know, melodic type languages. They, if people are rappers for a good part of their life, 
do they encourage, encode speech differently then? Because all of their saying is, is purely rhythmic based. And so there's been something that we've discussed amongst uh, uh, the clinicians, that some of the young people, if they have a traumatic brain injury, um, it's almost more, di depending on where the injury is, it's almost more difficult for them to recover speech because they, they've lost, if they've lost that rhythmic cueing perception, they just, the words are so attached to the rhythm that it doesn't come out as well. So I wonder if there's, what the mechanism is for that. <coughs> so that raises an interesting question. In, uh, in tonal languages like Chinese, is any do you know whether they're using a lot of information to have there? Is there any evidence that it's uh, better? Sure. There was, there's been a study with people with aphasia that of to, um, people with tonal languages if the evidence of aphasia is as much. Do you know? Uh, I don't know if they are using their MIT. I, I, I haven't doubt. heard of any. I, I doubt, doubt too. I I because doubt even too. the US, the MIT is not really up No. Except I'll, in your... Uh, yeah, you know why? Like, now it's interesting. The reason why MIT... MIT was, was presented years ago. Um, as a technique, right? 50 years now. It wasn't new, it, w it wasn't successful because you have to have intensive engagement time. That's why Gottfried Schlag's research is so effective is because he has people in this study doing very rigorous exercises over the course of months. And that's where you see the change. In the early, with, um, not Rasha, um, El uh, Esther Brooks. Yes. Helms Esther Brooks. When she originated the technique, um, if you only pay, if, if speech therapy is only paid for 16 sessions and whatever it is, and you don't have that intensity of the treatment, it's only a fluke that the person is, that the patient is able to repeat and do well with that technique. But in, like my my friend Harvey, who was able to internalize that technique and use it consistently, unless the patient has that repetition and is forced to only sing song words back, they're not going to be able to carry it over. So it was stopped from speech therapy as a regular technique because the intensity of the therapy is too costly. So people who, um, I think Agafi has a clinic now where people can go and actually get intensive therapy and some other places are doing this as well, but usually self pay so. So what I was thinking is that there may be an irony that in a tonal language, since the tone is a phonemic structure, uh, melodic intonation may actually interfere with the word there you go. usage. That's right. And, and so I was wondering which way it would go. Yeah, that is interesting. That's an interesting concept. is a, a broader cue that allows more of, um, how can I say, um, that allows more information to inform the patient of what it is they need to do. So in a typical, say, physical therapy um, session, the person will be given instructions to walk, maybe follow a visual cue. They may even have what's called a, um, dynamic metronome, you know, just uh, walking to a beat. But the person being able to self-cue and carry that over doesn't always happen. Or the person may have some cognitive deficits that, uh, or perceptual deficits that doesn't allow them to follow that that well. So the melody and the music and the rhythm sometimes provides additional information that informs them the pulse of the music, or the pulse that they need to respond to, I should say. So in the cases where we've seen people actually improve different from traditional therapy is when the person is already showing um, more improvement in traditional therapy. So if you make people in those studies when people are equal, because obviously when you're doing research they have to be as close as possible, um, the outcomes are going to be the same because the 
the person who has no cognitive deficits, who follows and is motivated, is going to do well in music or in traditional therapy anyway, right? But if you get a person who has cognitive deficits, who's not motivated, who may have depression, they're not going to do well in traditional therapy. We actually did a little um, proof, of, proof of concept study where we had people who were discharged from therapy sooner than they should have been because they weren't engaged, weren't motivated, depressed, and then we put them in music therapy for like two or three weeks. They actually improved and started matching those goals, and they were, then we were able to get them referred back to traditional therapy. So that's where, if you see those studies, or if we were able to expand on the pilot that we did, that's where you'll see the change. And I think for um, music therapy to be a billable service in rehabilitation is to really target those people who fall between the cracks, who don't do well in traditional therapy. Because if you show they're equal, then there's no reason to have a music therapist. But if you show that there's actually a cost benefit, because you can target the people who actually end up being in the institution longer because they don't do well, then we have an argument for why it's as important for these special cases. So just thanks very yeah. much. Uh, that was great. And we're just going to take a short break, about 10 minutes, and then we'll set up for our final panel.